What you're about to see is a story and pictures of oppression and the people's resistance to it. What you're about to see is the story of slavery in America. million black slaves in the United States before the Civil War. And they were trying to break the chains that bound them into slavery. Oh, they resisted more than just the hard labor, the beatings, and the chains, because there are things more painful to people, more destructive than what happens to the body. But they're much harder to see. The fear, the confusion, the hopelessness, the quiet crying inside of people who are not allowed the basic rights of human dignity. You will hear some of the words written and spoken by those slaves, and you will hear the words of those who call themselves masters. We cannot escape from the sound and acts of history. White, red, yellow, or black, you can never hide the past. Not if you really want to understand the present. Now, why slavery? Why master? Why in America? We didn't invent slavery. It's been part of civilization since one man first conquered another man. Captain Philip Drake, slave trader. Ancient Egyptians, uh, Greeks, uh, Romans, well, the Africans themselves had both held and been slaves during the first few courses of history. Before the African slave trade, slaves were usually prisoners of war or criminals paying their debts to society. They had certain rights by law and custom, could buy or work their way to freedom. Even the first black immigrants who came to Jamestown in 1619 could work their way out of bondage, buy land, vote, testify in court, work and walk equally with whites. Then something happened. Call it labor shortage, call it economic desperation, it tipped the balance, and for the first time in history, a group of people were singled out and denied those precious rights of humanity only because of their color. By the middle of the 1600s, slaves were no longer people. The traders called them black gold. Treated them like a commodity. We came chained two by two, left leg to right leg, from a thousand villages and towns. Houses, Mandingos, Yorubas, Igbos, Afix, Cruz, Fantine, Ashantis, Dahomians, Beanies, Sengalese. His name was Olanda Equiana, but he was called Gustavus Bassa. He wrote how he had been captured at the age of 11. We were like books on a library shelf, with not so much room as a man in a coffin. The shrieks of the women and the groans of the dying made the whole scene a horror almost inconceivable. I would not eat, so they beat me. I could talk to no one because I could not understand any of the African languages around me. Could find no one for my own nation. He was forced to march with hundreds of others for 500 miles across rivers, mountains, barefooted and naked, to be packed into the hole of a slave ship separated from people of his own nation. We had to separate them so they couldn't talk to each other. Mixed up the nations, or the blacks would be able to talk and get together, mutiny and destroy the ship's crew in hopes to get away. I tell you, the slave trade was a dangerous business. There are records of more than 100 successful slave revolts on the high seas.
Men do not submit easily to chains. But their chains are not so easily broken either. Despite the resistance, the slave trade prospered because white men demanded hands to work the wide rolling lands of America so they could profit from sugar, cotton, rice. They bought these hands and worked them to the limits of human endurance, providing only a minimum of food, clothing, and shelter. What would you do if you were turned from human being into another man's property and treated like a beast of the fields? How would you feel? These people could be bought and sold at auctions, willed to relatives, rented out, lost at cards, even won in raffles. The slaves were trapped as if they were in a maze. David, where you going? See my friend, see Joe. You best stay put. You want to get beaten again? Can't stay cooped up like a chicken. Got to go where I want. Somewhere, sometime, got to go where I want. You're a fool, man. Get yourself beat to death unless you remember you're a slave. Slave can't go nowhere. Slave can't go nowhere. Slave can't go nowhere. Slave can't go nowhere. The black man came as a stranger to a strange land. Couldn't speak the language. When he ran, there was nobody to run to, and everybody could see him running. He was visible. He couldn't hide in the white man's world. The black man is always and forever visible. Think of what it's like to be held down with fear and violence unable to understand what is happening to you. Torn from a civilization that had laws and learning 500 years before the birth of Christ. We have, as far as possible, closed every avenue by which light might enter their lives. Learning is officially a crime. Teaching the black man is a crime. In some states, punishable by death. Even without reading or writing, even without the right to talk with each other in the fields, slaves found ways to express their pain and anger. What couldn't be said could be sung or shouted. A language of resistance the master could not understand, but is now a part of the cultural heritage of America. By the middle of the 1700s, the world around both master and slave was beginning to change. After the American and French revolutions, men began to speak out and fight for civil rights and freedom as they never had before. Here in America is liberty of conscience, which is right and reasonable. Here ought to be likewise liberty of body and soul. The Quakers were the first to catch the anguished cry of rebellion by the Negroes. And in 1787, the men who met in Philadelphia to write a new constitution decreed that the African trade should end in 20 years. They reasoned that the end of the slave trade would dry up the source of evil. It was a compromise but it did nothing to change the condition of those who were already slaves. Then two things happened which increased the demand for slaves and made their condition worse. First, there was the new kind of cotton gin invented by Eli Whitney in 1793, which could do the work previously done by 50 slaves. As cotton fabric became cheap, the world demand for cotton rose, and more labor was needed to produce it. The slave population, less than a million in 1793, 
soared to four million just before the Civil War. Second, in 1803, Thomas Jefferson bought the vast Louisiana Territory from Napoleon, doubling the land area of the United States. And cotton growers streamed across the Mississippi into the new land. Although the importing of slaves was illegal, it became a bigger business than ever. Cotton production soared from a few million to two billion bales. The price of slaves rose from $200 to as much as $2,000 each. And men who already owned slaves found a new and brutal way to capitalize on their investment. They bought and sold slaves like cattle to start breeding farms to raise children for sale as soon as they were workable. To the white masters, they were no longer people. My brothers and sisters were bid off first, one by one, while my mother, paralyzed by grief, held me by the hand. Her turn came as she was bought by I. Slavery Brown. is ruinous to whites. Retards improvement. The evil admits of no remedy because the master has no capital but what is invested in human flesh. But even though some people saw the evil, things only got worse. A slave couldn't legally get married. He couldn't gather in groups to pray unless a white person was present. And in Mississippi, the law said a slave couldn't beat a drum or blow a horn. They wouldn't let black men communicate with each other. Well, you people cannot understand our color folks. Why, they are the freest, happiest people in the world, if you look at it properly. Look, they never have to worry about a solitary thing. Got a good place to live, food, clothes. They get sick, we see to it, they're up on their feet in quick time. Life just couldn't be simpler or better. No, sir, you never really understood the darky like we do. couldn't find a better living, loving, happier group of people anywhere in the whole cotton-picking world. The dream of these happy slaves was to be free. So many slaves tried to run away that there were patrols and bounty hunters everywhere, and most fugitives were caught and returned to their masters. But many of those who stayed found other ways to resist. They burned crops, buildings, they broke tools and damaged machinery, injured livestock, and often pretended to be ill to get out of work. The resistance was so widespread that a highly respected Southern scientist and medical expert of the 19th century, Dr. Samuel Cartwright of the University of Louisiana claimed to have found the cause in two rare diseases. The Negro suffers from one rare disease I have discovered called, uh, from the Greek, drapetomania. It is the disease that causes slaves to run away. The other disease is Dicethesia Ethiopica, which the overseers call rascality. The individuals affected with Dicethesia Ethiopica, they slight their work, slow down, cut up corn, cotton, cane, or tobacco when hoeing, as if for pure mischief. However, both these troublesome diseases can be almost entirely prevented. The medical treatment is called whipping the devil out of them. We know that masters tried to hold down resistance in many ways. Not all were violent. Some tried to use kindness. But what did kindness matter to a man who couldn't call his soul his own? 
That man fought back in every way possible. We've seen how he used his songs to express the pain and anger, how he managed to slow down and disrupt the work demanded of him, how he risked punishment and even death to run away. All of this was resistance. But it was the increase of knowledge among the slaves that the white master feared most of all. If one could extinguish their capacity to see the light, they would be on a level with the beasts of the field, and we should be safe. But they weren't safe, because learning to read and write became another form of black resistance. David, where you get that book? Stole it. They put you in chains to catch you. They beat you, Dave. Gotta learn to read and write, Josie. But they kill you, David, to catch you. They kill you. Horse. Uh, careful, don't talk too loud. G. Is that a C? And John H. said... This passion to steal an education could not be stopped. The Bible, catalogs, school books, they used any book they could find from which to learn to read and to write. Sure, some were staying and some were running. But even running means different things. You run from, but you also run to. To freedom, to education, to accomplishment. And they ran. The house slaves who were butlers, cooks, maids, nurses, and the city slaves who were trained tailors, shoemakers, carpenters, wheelwrights, weavers, tanners, mechanics, as well as all the field hands. By the middle of the 1800s, these people had plenty of footsteps to follow. Phyllis Wheatley kidnapped from Africa when she was nine, educated herself and became a poet. Her first book of poems published in London in 1773 was the second volume of poetry published by a woman in America. James Beckworth, a runaway slave who became a tough frontier scout and later chief of the Crow Indians. He was a Western hero, discovered a pass through the Sierra Nevadas that became an important gateway to California during the gold rush. William Wells Brown was a runaway slave who taught himself to read and write, was America's first Negro novelist and playwright. And James W.C. Pennington was an illiterate slave blacksmith who escaped to the North, educated himself, learned to read and write in Greek, Latin, German, went to college, wrote the first Negro history in 1841. Many slaves escaped and carried the struggle for freedom into the North, where there were black doctors, inventors, lawyers, judges, and teachers who were already winning public attention and victories. Even before the Civil War, from New England to California, there were court battles, sit-ins, freedom rides, the escaped slaves did not forget their families in the South. They got jobs and education, but they also joined organizations, gave financial support, and helped in the Underground Railroad. Because many believed what their great leader, Frederick Douglass, said. I have held all my life, and shall hold to the day of my death, that the fundamental and everlasting objection to slavery it's not that it sinks a Negro to the condition of a brute, but that it sinks a man to that condition. While a slave boy in Baltimore, Douglas learned to read and write, despite the laws making it a crime. When I was about 13 years old and had successfully learned to read, every increase of knowledge added an almost intolerable burden to the thought, I am a slave for life. To my bondage, I saw no end. It was a terrible reality. And I shall never be able to tell you how sadly that thought chafed my young spirit. 
I was too much a youth to think of running away immediately. Frederick Douglass did escape, educated himself, fought to free his brothers in chains, published the story of his life, daring his master to come and recapture him. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. If we ever get free from the wrongs heaped upon us, we must pay for their removal. We must do this by labor, by suffering, by sacrifice, and if need be, by our lives and the lives of others. They did risk their lives. Men like Denmark Vesey planned large revolts in the South, involving hundreds. The legendary Nat Turner dreamed of white spirits and black spirits engaged in battle. He led a small band on a bloody rampage that took 60 white lives. Fear swept across the South. Men slept with guns to protect themselves, called their legislatures to enact new protective measures. But the number of revolts and conspiracies to revolt went above 250 before the end of the slave period. Because the call had come. The roaring, rushing drive to own oneself was bigger than the fear of being caught or killed. So it's 1850, and the black man struggled to break his chains by revolts, by running away, by stealing an education, and by all the other forms of resistance, both active and passive, has now begun to shape the nation. White men, North and South, are forced to take sides in a deepening crisis that will lead to a terrible civil war, to the Emancipation Proclamation, and the tragedy of unfulfilled promises of freedom and equality which were to follow. The story of slavery in America is a story of dreadful oppression and of heroic resistance to that oppression. Our story began the day the first slave ship left Africa, and it cannot end until the last chain of slavery and its scars have disappeared from our land. <laughs>